Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the vote now tonight. For the launch of this wonderful novel, The Last Pants. Our work tonight is work that's been published in more than 40 countries, translated into 27 languages. It's done awards in France, Sweden, Germany, USA, South Africa, and probably a couple other countries that I'm forgetting. The good news is Billy Crystal is back, Vaughn Cupido is back, Mike Cananey is back, Pierre <laughs> Mayer is back. The best. John Matthew is also back. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it up here, I promise. <laughs> the best fiction is timeless. Non-fiction tends to be more time-bound, particularly when you're writing about current affairs. Because of that, I was slightly nervous when I started reading Leon's new book and saw that, or began to understand, that the book is kind of anchored uh, in a very particular point in South Africa's very, very recent history. Um, the president of South Africa in this book is somebody called Jacob Zuma, who is, of course, no longer the president. Um, and part of the fight is around uh, a, a plot to remove him from office in a sort of violent, non-democratic, unparliamentary kind of way. <laughs> um, when, you're, when you're writing fiction, which is so, as I say, rooted in, in what is going on in a particular country and current affairs, I think it's a very, very dangerous thing to do because what you're writing about um, becomes out of date very, very quickly. Um, I have absolutely no reason to worry. Um, Dion has pulled it off in an absolutely remarkable way, and I think that there's two main reasons for that. The one is that while Jacob Zuma may be gone, uh, all the shenanigans to do with the SSA and everything that goes around it are still unfortunately with us. More importantly, Dion May is an incredibly skilled writer who could make absolutely anything readable and believable. It is a, I, to my mind, it is as good or better than anything he's ever written. Um, I read it over the weekend uh, in 24 hours. Um, I couldn't put it down. Um, and I'm sure that everybody else is going to absolutely love it as well. We're very, very happy this evening to have the king of thriller writing in South Africa, together with the king of talk show radio. Please welcome John Ray. Thank you. That will do. And the president's not called Jacob Zuma, and the president's not called anything. He's quite obviously uh, Jacob Zuma, but he's never given that name. So I get to page 344, and it's, um, it hasn't taken me long, I haven't put it down. I get to page 344, and I read a man by the name of Zungu, a big man, my father said. Very big, a very dangerous man. He was at my father's house on Friday night, and two other men, all from the state security agency. They told me they'd had Lonnie killed with a Russian drug and that they would do something unimaginably terrible to him unless he told them everything. Wow! Page 345. Except it's page 313. So here's the story, the soil samples we usually get from footprints and tires and that sort of thing. But I've read that bit. 314, 315, all the way through to 344, and that they would do something unimaginably terrible to him unless he told them everything. That was my book that they sent me. I don't know whether they were testing my loyalty to you. But I passed. I went and found the nearest exclusive books and sat there, took one out that had page 325, and I read through to the end. Question, how do you keep a talk show, a talk show radio host in suspense if you send him that book? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think, Dion, most of our conversation will focus on this book. But uh, just, I mean, we're all, we're here because we're fans of this man and we've been fans of every book that he has written and we've read them all and enjoyed them all. But let's just go back a, a little bit. Um, the first thing that you had published was a story, short story in Iceland. Yeah, that's right. Do you still have it? I do. I, and uh, you like it? Yeah, it has a certain charm. I, mean, I, 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 have a, uh, I have a soft spot for it. Let me just say thank you very much to everybody who's here tonight. I am really honored by your presence. Thank you, Mervyn, for having me at the Book Lounge. It is my favorite bookstore in all the world. I still think it's got the most beautiful bookstore toilet in all the world. Um, if you haven't seen it, you should really check it out. John, thank you very much. <laughs> 
Uh, that was a very good way of avoiding that question. Right? You don't no, think I, that short story is that sharp. You know, I, I, I look back on everything that I've written and everything has a certain value. I mean, it was the first thing that I wrote that I got money, got paid for uh, outside of journalism uh, and my job. It was the first piece of fiction. I also look back on my early writing and realize how bad it was. But then the good thing about that is that I also understand how much I've learned in the process and it also reminds me of how much I still have to learn because writing is a lifelong learning process. But um, I, I have a, a, a real soft spot for my, for my early short stories. Now, I, I thought The Dead Before Dying, the Afrikaans um, uh, was Phoenix, was, was the first one. But then I discovered that you published an Afrikaans novel, which never translated into English, in 1994 called Viva Spell. Yeah. And I tried to order it. Well, I, I did order it, but it hasn't arrived yet, so I haven't had a chance to look at it. And, and I wondered why you've not had that. Because it has been reissued in Afrikaans, <laughs> yeah, well, but you've not had it translated. Let me tell you the story of, of that book. Um, when I, it was the first novel that I wrote. Uh, I, it was just, I started writing after the end of a partner. My, that's an interesting thing. I just don't think you can write crime or suspense fiction in a society like the apartheid society was. You can't have a hero who represents the state like Benny Fussell in, in that environment. Be that as it may, I wrote my first novel and my uh, title for it was Icarus. I sent it off to MB Publishers and it was the first suspense fiction that they had received in something like 20 years. Nobody knew what to do with it. Uh, the first thing they told me was that one word titles do not work in Afrikaans at all. Uh, so they have to change that. Phoenix, Orion, Proteus, Infanta, Sapa, Kur, Kurbra, Kurs. Nobody knew how to to put it. So they they read it, and I think in Afrikaans during that time it was generally seen that suspense fiction was very common. It was for less intelligent people, so they published it with a very common cover. A really gaudy, half-naked woman on the cover, and they put it out there. And they printed 1,200, and they sold uh, some total of 800 books. And they wrote me a letter saying, "Well, we're going to pulp the other 400, so you can buy as many as you want for one grand each." So I bought 20, so that I could at least show my grandchildren that I had published a book. Uh, and, but it was a long process to get it published. And by that time, I had written the second novel, which became Dead uh, Before Dying. Um, and they said they're not interested because obviously my books are not there in the cell. Luckily, another publisher, Quality <laughs> Eddie Scholes, she picked it up, and that was the book that, that opened a lot of doors for me. Um, but I often say that that first book is a lot like having a brother in jail. You can't deny it, but you don't want to talk about it. <laughs> so I was up on the West Coast talking some years later, talking to a whole room, a book club, a whole room full of little old ladies. And I used this uh, saying of, you know, it's like having a brother in jail. And afterwards, this one little old lady came up to me. She said, uh, so tell me, how's your brother? <laughs> <laughs> so, the good thing is that uh, 10 years later, we republished the book and it has sold something like 50,000 now. So, um, you know, it's still not in English. No, I don't think it's good enough to be translated. I don't think it's good enough for the international market. It is. Well, what about us here? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you're not missing all that much. I feel a little bit ashamed about it, but it's out there. Um, Dion, you, I, I read somewhere where you were asked why you chose the thriller genre. And, you know, genre descriptions are useful to, to booksellers. They know where to put the books on the shelf and, and so on. Um, I, I'm on record as saying many, many times that the kind of work that you do, that Lawrence Block does, that uh, James B. Burke does, that um, you know, James Crumley, a whole lot of people like that, they say more about the countries in which those novels are set and about social conditions and historical inequalities and injustices and all of those important things which are key themes in literary fiction. They, they say more about those things than, than many literary fiction novels. But we do have these genre descriptions. And you said that you didn't choose thriller genres. You just write stories, and the stories turn out to be categorizable as thrillers. 
You know, that's true. You know, when I, when I started writing, I had certain stories that, that made me excited. And you have to be excited about a story if you're going to spend 12 to 18 to 24 months writing it. Uh, but I never spent a lot of time. I, I love, I've always loved station, and especially crime fiction. Ed McBain, John D. McDonald, that, that sort of thing. I, I cut my reading teeth on them as a teenager. So when I started writing, the stories that I wanted to tell were all in that sort of ballpark. But I never worried about, am I writing genre fiction? I, it doesn't concern me. For me, the most important thing is to try and make the story work in such a way that it is hugely entertaining. That's my only hope. I have no other agenda. I don't, uh, I don't apart purposely uh, try and put in social commentary or political commentary. If that is weaved into the story, if the characters, if I uh, set the story in a specific time, in a specific city, and my characters interact with that world, I want to keep it as real as possible without it interfering too much in the story. But for me, story and entertainment is everything. I want to write the kind of story that I would have loved to read. Um, and it's a gamble because you, you, know, you never know are there enough people out there who I'm going to share your taste in, in stories. Um, so, yeah, I... I and the, the stories that you choose to tell all have murdered people in them. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody trying to find out who murdered them. So, why is it, Dion? Now, sit back, lean back, take a deep breath, and tell me why these stories attract you. Well, as I say, you know, I started reading Ed McBain and Johnny McDonald, and I think stories about life and death, I've spent a lot of time thinking why crime fiction is the most popular genre internationally. I mean, from Scandinavia to Zimbabwe, Uganda, uh, the UK, uh, Europe, America. And I think there are a lot of reasons. I think one of them is that we as a society spend so much time trying to order the society to make sure that everybody conform to the rules of the society. That, and murder is the, the biggest uh, disturbance of of that society. It is the thing that challenges uh, society most. Uh, we always want to know why did someone kill another person? How could we stop that? I think that's, it's that fascination. I share that fascination. And I just think it's, uh, it's, it's cool to write stories about them. Uh, but again, I, I don't try and overthink it. Um, I develop a story and if, if I feel passionate and excited about it, then I tell it. And the rest really is just Baraka. And, uh, don't worry about it too much. And I know that you've said to me in an interview before, and I've, I've heard you say it in other interviews, that um, you don't say, right, I'm going to write a Benny Crystal or a Matt Jaber novel. You say, I want to tell the story. And then the story suggests to you whether one of the characters that you've already written um, suits the story or whether somebody else, um, you know, you need to create a new character to drive this particular story. We first met Benny in... Um, in uh, Dead Devils. What well, in Dead Before yeah. Dying, he, he had a little cameo. He was supposed to be on in, in Dead Before Dying for just one or two pages, and then he sort of worked his way yeah. into the story. But Devil Speak was our first. His first uh, protagonist uh, for us. Yeah. And that was a drunk club policeman. Yeah, yeah but that was with very problem. few with very few um, characteristics that redeemed yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, in the beginning. Yeah, but that, you know when I. When I created him in Bed Before Dying, I just needed a drunk cop to walk in on the protagonist and spoil his fun. Uh, so I created this guy, and I named him after one of my favorite teachers at school, because I didn't want to spend too much time. You know, I spoiled a lot of your fun. <laughs> yeah. uh, he, was a, he was a great guy. I mean, I, I admired the hell out of him, and it was sort of just a little bit of a, you know, I'll, I'll use his name. Uh, and I honestly did not think that this Benny Crystal character would be in Dead Before Dying for more than maybe two or three pages. But he was just such a delightful character. He made things happen in the creative process of writing. So eventually he became one of the strongest sub-characters. And by the end of that novel, I knew I wanted to bring this guy back. And with, with Devil's Peak, it was the perfect story for him. But then I had the dilemma. I had created this very cliche of the alcoholic cop. So what do you do with that? Uh, how do you make it fresh? How do you make it different? How do you make it interesting? And I, I spent a lot of time. Uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful story about Elaine Fumble. You know, those of you who are old enough to remember her, she she was my first translator into English. Now, Mother Elaine was uh, self-acknowledged alcoholic. She, she was very open about it. 
uh, she, when she sent me her translated uh, uh, chapters, uh, I would call her and say, Marlene, I, could, I can exactly see what you did before and after lunch. So, <laughs> and she would laugh her very famous laugh and say, yes, Marlene, I'll, I'll do them over again. But Marlene took me, I asked Marlene to take me with her to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, uh, which was also very hilarious because of, she was so famous and her voice was so uh, well known that if she stood up and she said, hello, I'm Marlene from Bullion and I'm an alcoholic, everybody burst out laughing. <laughs> But I learned a lot from her. Uh, she introduced me to other alcoholics at these meetings. So I really researched what it was like truly to be an alcoholic. And it's wonderful after the first penny, uh, protagonist novel was published, uh, police people who were alcoholics approached me. So I, and I kept the discussion going. Could, and let's just look at what's going past there. I'm not <laughs> And the next novel began. On their way to Kinky Boots. So, so that's how that's how baby. And, and, you know, okay, so we take you at face value, uh, because you appear to be an honest man, <laughs> that the story suggests the main character, and Benny is the only one who's appeared more than twice, I think, of your major protagonists, which means for some reason, for some reason, stories suggest Benny more than they do Matt or... You know, uh, it, it's not as simple as having the story first and then going in search of characters. Obviously, you know, once... I realized how much readers like Benny Fussell. There is the motivation of, if you have two or three story options, maybe go with the one that is better for Benny Fussell. So it becomes a much more complicated process. Um, but Fever is a good case in point where I had a story where Benny did not feature at all. Um, Trackers is another one that just wasn't space for Benny. So if, if the story, if I feel so passionate about a story, and I really think that there's no place for Benny, then I will go with it. Uh, but there's obviously also the pressure from publishers all over the world who say, do another Benny, because series sell better than uh, 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 normal series books. So all these things have an influence when you start developing stories, start thinking about possibilities. I, as, as somebody who, I mean, I read voraciously, um, I'm reading at least three books a week, and at least one of them is non-fiction, so I'm reading a thriller and a literary fiction and a non-fiction every week, sometimes more than that, often more than that. And with, with fiction, whether it's literary fiction or thriller fiction, I'm always amazed at the ability to come up with and tease out and complete a story. And... So many writers that I've interviewed over the years have said to me that I don't come up with a story, I come up with an idea, and then the characters take over and tell the story. And you've told me as well before that that's how you work. So, I mean, this, how much can one say about the plot of this without spoiling things? Um, Benny and Vaughan are investigating a very strange murder. A body is found in the Karoo. And it turns out that the body has been thrown off Robos Rail some time before, quite a long time before. And Benny and Vaughan have to work out, first they have to identify who the person is, and then they have to work out who might have thrown him off a moving Robos Rail train. And the, the second strand of the story takes place in, in, in France mostly, where somebody who we meet as Daniel Daré and he's trying to live a quiet life, but it's obvious that he has a history which has violence associated with it. And he's trying to live a quiet life with an autistic furniture restorer. And can I say what he was in a previous life? I think not. I think let's, let's keep that for the reason. I, yeah. I wrote it as a, as a revealing surprise. So yeah. Okay. Let's... So, um, and, and it's, it's obvious because it's always the case that these two stories interlink and one of the bits of suspense is how you're constantly thinking how does Benny's investigation 
link in with the story which starts in, 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 in France. And how, and it is, I think, the most overtly political of, of your books. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, so we'll get back to that. So how did this story start? Was there a moment where you went, okay, I'm going to tell this story? Yes, there was. And I, I, although I don't say the name of the president in the whole book, um, there was a time when you wished that something yeah, you did. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I mean, let me just give a bit of background on that. I, having been published in, in Europe, in North America, 50 to 60 percent of all the interviews I do over there with book launches are political. I have to field questions about South Africa for 60 percent of every interview. Uh, sometimes intense interviews. Uh, I remember a Dutch television interview that was. I was exhausted afterwards because I was sort of representing South Africa and I was being asked why I think so bad. And I've, I've always regarded myself as a, an ambassador, a loyal ambassador to this country. I've tried to promote tourism. I've tried to tell the world that uh, after Mandela we were going to be fine, uh, how hard we were working. And Jacob Zuma's reign, and I, the thing is when, when Zuma were, became president, I was the idiot who said to, especially the French media, just give him a chance. This, this man has done wonderful work in the struggle. Give him the opportunity to show that don't uh, 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 say that he's not going to make it before he's had the opportunity. So all of this meant that I was even more infuriated when we realized how corrupt a criminal he was. Uh, so it was pure anger that made me think, but shouldn't someone get rid of this man in a more democratic way? <laughs> um, and I thought, well, that's, that's a great premise for the next novel. So it absolutely came from my frustration and anger at what was happening in our country. And, and can you give us some insight how you take, how you take that idea, right? I, I'm going to make as the centerpiece of my story the hanger on which everything else hangs an attempt to get rid of Jacob Zuma by extra parliamentary means. What happens between that and, no, not this one, this is the one that's, <laughs> this is the one that's complete. First of all, you have to think, okay, but there are other elements as well. Um, we've been going to Bordeaux in France now for the last 10 years. We fell in love with the city and we go twice a year. And we, we love the place. And the more we go there, the more time we spend there, the more I think, I want to write about this because it's interesting, it's fascinating, it's beautiful, the history there. Uh, uh, so that's at the back of your mind. And then when you think, okay, you want to kill the president, why not in France? It's, it's, it's going to be much more difficult maybe in South Africa. And it's such a lovely setting. So if you have those two guys, what better place to die? He doesn't look as evil as he's so entertainment, you know, so, <laughs> so and then you think, okay, so how, where would that happen? I spent a week walking Paris streets to try and find the, uh, first of all I had to go to the embassy and I s spoke to some former diplomats, uh, but where would the South African president stay when they go to Paris, when they have a, a state visit in France? Where would they meet, where would they stay? So I spent a week walking around the hotels, there are three hotels where they usually stay, um, around the South African Embassy, to try and look at this from an assassin's point of view. So it's really, the research starts kicking in. You, you, you research the hell out of the subject, because the more, the more you do research, the more creative choices you have. So once you have more or less the idea of what's going to happen in France, then you start thinking, okay, how do I tie that? conspiracy to what happens in South Africa and then uh, but but, I mean the idea of the, the, the dead man yeah. thrown off road lost rail well, does, uh, yeah. that, does that sort of thing does it strike you in the middle of the night or <laughs> are you walking the dogs when you go ha ah, ah. I think all authors are busy developing stories 24 hours a day I mean, in your sleep and when you're awake you, you read something, you see something you hear something we love, Marianne and I love traveling on trains. So every time I'm on a train, I think, oh, can, this, can this window open? Can we throw out a bar? <laughs> I, I know I'm a sick puppy, but that's the way I do it. That's my 
that job to be better. So, and so that was the other thing. I've always thought, well, it would be lovely to have a, a sort of a murder on the Orient Express South African version or something like that. What can one do? And then I, I decided, okay, let's have a murder in South Africa on a train. And I, there's the, the train called Business Class, a transnet train called Business Class that runs between Cape Town and the Joburg. And I told one of my friends, I'm, I'm going to go write that and do some research. And he said, no, no, but he's in the tourist industry. And I thought about Rovost Rail. And I said, no, I haven't heard of it. It's a hell of an expensive ride to go do some research. And he said, leave it to me. Two weeks later, Rovost Rail called and said, you're welcome to put a, a murder on our train. <laughs> We'll sponsor, we'll sponsor you and Mario for a trip to <laughs> So that's how that happened. So we researched that. I threw Mario off the train. Just to see if the window would open up. So, you know, it's, it's like a little bit of a puzzle that you start collecting through research. And some of the places. Uh, I, did a, I did a 15 day trip on Robus Rail from, from Joburg up to Dar es Salaam. And all I thought about was my next drink. <laughs> so, which is why I'm an interviewer and not an author. No, and, and, and slowly it all, at what point are you writing a book? Well, I, usually I, I do about three months of research. Um, when I finish one book, I start researching because I usually have the next book's rough idea in my head. And then I will start doing research, talk to people, uh, present places order books, go online and find whatever information I need. Because I really think that research is the biggest part of the creative process, because it feeds your imagination. It gives you so many more choices. If you have 10 things that you can choose between on where to set a murder or uh, whatever you're working with, for instance, there's research about uh, um, boreholes and the, uh, the soil levels in boreholes. Uh, so I went to speak to a professor in geology at Stanford University, and through that interview came very interesting information that you can use. So, uh, so I do three months of, of research, and when I have a potential ending in mind, the next big point for me is where do I start? Uh, because that's a very important place. It's a very important thing for the novel. You can't start too late. You can't start too early. You've got to find that sweet spot. Once I know where I want to start, then I'm fucking done. So you already had an idea of the ending. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you the, I, the the book was about an attempt yeah. to kill yeah. the South African yeah. president in Paris. So whether it's a successful attempt or an unsuccessful yeah. attempt, and you have to read the book to find yeah. out, that is kind of your ending. Yeah, yeah. and I, I honestly did not know if it was going to be a successful attempt. Really? I, no, because. Um, I did not know if Zuma was going to be re-elected president. That, that would have made a difference. Uh, so you know, that I, I had to wait for that. Uh, and that had an influence on the ending. I also did not know how I, would, uh, I was going to exactly tie the two stories together. But you sort of know that you, it's coming and then you, you keep thinking about that point all through the writing of the book and maybe three or four weeks before you get there you think okay that's, that's probably the best way to do that. And, and now to, to your very frank admission this is by some instance the most political book that you've written as always you um, you cast some members of the Hawks in a, in a very good light and I know that it's important you will talk about that as well but you know the the, the VIP protection unit and, and the arrogance the, the, the deeply unpleasant arrogance and Corruption that is shown by them, the state security agency, about, you know, we probably know one fiftieth of the terrible things that they've done, and we imagine the rest. Um, were you at all worried that, that by writing a more political book than you've ever written before, you might put off some readers? No, I did not, because I think the anger was pretty much universal amongst readers. I think readers are people who are informed. Uh, and they understand much better. Uh, I think the people who might have been offended by that just won't read. They don't read. That, that's my theory. And I haven't had any negative feedback so far. Uh, although the book is only now out in English, so we'll see. But I, I don't think so. I think the, uh, the unhappiness about uh, the previous government was fairly universal amongst informed people. And 
Vaughan and, and Benny, as uh, it's impossible now to imagine them not working together. Although the ending, well, the ending, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen with the ending of this book? But, you know, I mean, Vaughan, again, it's, it's fairly overt. Vaughan is, is, is dating a woman, um, and she has a son who is 11, 12 years, yeah. And he says outright to, to Vaughan Cupido, you're one of the hawks, you'll catch it. And this really annoys Vaughan, because he's not, he's never been, he never will be. Catch it. Benny, the only thing that's catching Benny is alcohol and now Alexa. Yeah. But, it, but again, and I know that it's very, very important for you to, to say that within the law enforcement agencies of South Africa, there are people, flawed individually they might be, with you know, Benny's constant battle against the alcohol demon and Vaughan's sort of flashness and vanity and so on. But they're bloody hardworking and completely and utterly dedicated to the cause of law and order. And that is true. You know, when, uh, when I was writing this book, uh, we had the great privilege, Marianne and I, uh, being invited to the retirement party of one of the most famous hawks, uh, serious and violent crimes detectives in Cape Town. And we spent the whole morning with these people, and as I said, I was halfway with the book, and I just came under the impression again of how they are such dedicated hard workers working against all odds and, and then also working under uh, corrupt bosses higher up, not, not in Cape Town, I'm happy to say, uh, and how they were struggling with it, how they were struggling with the fact that people are looking at them and saying, you captured or you are part of the uh, corruption, and they're not, and how much pride they took telling me we're not. And, you know, the, the Serious and Violent Crimes Unit were some, something like 70 or 80 people when I started writing about the Hawks. They are now down to 16 or 70. Uh, the, the docket load is still huge. Hopefully it's going to change now in, in, in the coming uh, years. Although I have on good authority that the Hawks will probably disappear. They're going back to the old special murder and robbery squad units, which is also quite interesting. Um, but they are incredibly good people and I admire the hell out of them. It's, it's really to honor them that I have the cops who, who, who fight the good fight. Um, I just have so much admiration for them. So, I mean, there, there is a, a very minor subplot in this where their lovely boss, their absolutely do everything by the book boss, is tempted into doing something which is not entirely kosher. And, and the degree of unhappiness that she feels, the sort of soul tearing that happens inside her because she is, for the first time in her life, not acting exactly the way a decent Hawks officer should act. I mean, that's a wonderful, tiny bit of the book. Yeah, and, and that is also based on those cops that I, that I spend time with. I mean, there are black female cops that feel that way. Um, and they, a lot of them are built like Bada Kalini, um, but their hearts are pure, and that is a really beautiful thing. And Benny, you know, it's hard to imagine him now without Alexa at his side. Eh? Yeah, yeah. In, in, in this one, I think I can say this, that um, he decides that he's finally going to propose to Alexa. And he decides. <laughs> we don't know if she accepts or not. But he buys a ring and he worries desperately that it's too cheap. And, you know, she's had plenty of money in the past. And... Is she going to regard this ring and his proposal as cheapness? And and with Vaughan, they plot where, you know, what night it's going to be and where it's going to be at a fancy restaurant, and he worries about that. And it's again, it's it's just such a nice piece of humanity through the book that while they are fighting the corrupt people in the SSA and in the VIP protection unit, and while they're trying to puzzle out this mystery, he's planning how to say, will you marry me to the woman of his dreams? Yeah, you know, I think, I believe that there are several elements to certainly to stories that I enjoy reading. And one of them is the humanity of the characters. And you, I try to make them as human as possible. And in real life, these cops 
they are human beings, they have children at home, they have a wife or an ex-wife or whatever the case may be. And to me, that's it's a fun part of, of the story. Um, you want to add to Betty's words, you want to make life as difficult for him as possible because conflict is the mother of suspense. So the more conflict he has in his life, uh, personally and professionally, hopefully the, the better the story. Uh, I find great delight in his relationship with Alexa because they are such unique individuals. And I'm now writing the new Betty Houston at the moment. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's, there's more conflict between the two. And I'm loving it. Okay. Um, so, I mean, the ending, look, I mean, the ending doesn't suggest that there's not going to be another Benny Crystal because Benny Crystal is alive and well at the end of it. But his, his professional. He's alive but not so well. Let's yeah, say. professionally, he's not so well at the end of it. And, 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 and Alexa, with her history in the music industry and Benny playing moderate bass in a moderate band again it's just a, it's another element of, of flavor to it it's just adding a bit more depth to the character thank you John. yeah you know you, you, you try and, and, and give him a laugh that that is interesting uh, but but it's fitting to the job that he does and the kind of guy that he is he he's really only a detective everything else is mediocre so uh, but it's fun. It's fun to write a scene where he's playing uh, "Cry to Me" uh, and he does the vocals, and the band is just on a roll. And then the phone rings and he gets called out again. I mean, it's, it's a delightful scene to write. I relish those little scenes because the rest you worry so much about getting the rest right. But as certainly as, a, as an author, I enjoy those little oasis moments uh, through the book. And I presume you did an enormous amount of research for his mountain biking. <laughs> I did. Indeed. Is it true that you entered the Epps of Cape Epic just to get a sense of it? No, no, no I, But Benny, Benny now is getting yeah. thirsty riding a mountain bike. He rides up on Devil's Peak in the mornings, very early, early in the morning. He's getting changed. It's, it's, he's absolutely wonderful. Have you? Um, because one of the things that I have an issue with, because I mean, a lot of. There are very few interesting detectives, whether they're private eyes or members of the police force. There are very few of them that have very ordinary lives and are interesting. Um, all of them have, have some issue, um, some substance, mostly substance abuse or difficulty of keeping it in their pants and, and so on. And I get, I have very complex reactions to authors who allow their alcoholic detectives or their drug addicted detectives to fall off the wagon. I get really cross. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> and I know that it's part of being an alcoholic, is that you fall off the wagon. That's what an alcoholic means. It's a bloody difficult fight, 24 hours a day. And I mean, do, do you think about that kind of... Because I, a couple of times he has fallen off the wagon. Yeah, he, he hasn't for a while now. No, he hasn't. He fell off the wagon in Icarus. That was the last time. That was a one novel and one novella ago. Um, I think about that. I readers, a lot of readers react like you do. I mean, I get a lot of email uh, from people begging me not to let Benny fall off the wagon. I don't like it when he falls off too. But if the story demands that he falls off again, and I think that will make the story much more interesting uh, than what will happen. Although. I think through the years, Benny has grown stronger in terms of his alcoholism. And I think the chances of him falling off again are getting slimmer and slimmer. Although, he's in real trouble at the moment, the novel I'm writing, so it's going to be touching him. <laughs> it, it is, I mean, I, those of us who sit on the sidelines and, and criticize the police, we often do so without any understanding. And books like yours help us to some sort of understanding of the kinds of pressures that these people work under. Um, the, the standard number of dockets for a murder detective in London is eight. Eight dockets at one time. That is the standard. And, that, and I was reading something recently in one of the British quality papers saying that it very, very seldom goes beyond that. And here, as you will know, detectives in Kailich and younger places like that will add 140, 160 serious violent crime dockets on their desk at any one time. So you've got to deal with that. You've got to deal with the incredible levels of violence that are visited on serving police officers. 
what they've done, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, we have a case in the last 48 hours of a Hawks colonel who, uh, it now appears, shot herself. We, we don't know why. In, in the beginning, it was reported as a sort of family event, and so, you know, partner murder suicide was the thought, and now it appears that she locked herself in a room, fired a practice shot, and then, then killed herself. And we don't know exactly why, but we know we, it's got to be related to the level of stress that she is under working as a Hawks investigative officer. Absolutely. Uh, but as you say, I mean, the stress is tremendous. Just the, the, the traumatic uh, experience of standing at a murder scene where people are mutilated, people are dying, children are dead. I mean, that is, for anybody, that, that would be upsetting. But to do that every week, week in and week out, uh, under that pressure, with being paid so little, Having the public scorn at you because you're a, 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 a police man or woman, it takes its toll. I mean, in many cases, I did a lot of research on why uh, there's so much depression and alcoholism amongst South African policemen and women. I spoke to um, uh, a captain in the police who's, who's a psychologist who treats these people. She, she told me that one of the major reasons, and that's the one that I gave to Benny, was they, they feel inadequate in protecting their own, their, their own children, because they see what human beings are capable of every day. They see the horrible things that humans can do. They, they start fearing so much for their own loved ones, and they want to protect them, and they realize they can't. And that's, that's one of the major breakdown points for them. So it's, I mean, it's, it's horrible. Um, you, you can't put that reality into fiction, because it will just get too dark and gloomy. Um, because crime fiction <clears throat> must be entertaining in the end. But I try to to at least hold a little bit of a mirror up for readers to, to tell them all this is, this is a hard job. Um, three episodes of Trackers, Matt Joubert, um, which have been shown on Sunday nights on, on Mnet. How many people have, have seen that? It's really fantastic. It, it really is. You know, it, it, one's tempted to say, it's so good it looks international, but that's bullshit. You know, I mean, we can do international class stuff in almost everything we do. We just put that on the rugby field. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> but it, it really is. It's so classy. How how involved were you with? I mean, obviously, you would have been involved a lot with the script, but the other aspects of the production. Well, I I limited myself to heavy involvement with the script. I but there was a previous series made by a German producer based on Dead Before Dying that I thought was really bad. And after that, I, I decided I'm never not going to be involved again. So I was one of the executive producers on this series, and I, my involvement was I worked with the script writing team from the word go. We worked over months on the adaptation, um, and I think I, I was very happy with the scripts, although we had to make some really tough creative choices because you can't adapt the novel as is. Uh, I was very happy with the final stuff, and then. I led the team, I, I was part of the casting process, to me that was also very important. But once that was finalized, we let the, the team do their thing, and I think they were fantastic. I mean, it's, it's a really uh, a classy series, I think. I'm so proud of it. But you, you were saying to me before we started officially that um, your involvement with that and a very, very busy year in other regards has meant a slight pullback in your normal schedule, because generally, an, Afrikaans, um, an English version of the previous Afrikaans book comes out and then a month or two later the new Afrikaans novel comes out and you um, it took I think close to four years for the first one to be translated into English but now you've got into a kind of rhythm but this year has interrupted that rhythm. No absolutely um, I mean doing a series like this just the development of the scripts took four or five months of very intense involvement you know every time the team of writers wrote something I had to work through it just, just getting to the point where we didn't outline uh, two, three months. And then the whole writing process, the casting process. And then once they start shooting, you know, then you start talking HBO of America and ZDF of Germany are co co-production partners on this, negotiating with them. I'm just for interest's sake, uh, ZDF will broadcast what we, what, what, what the Americans will broadcast six one-hour episodes. The Germans will broadcast three two-hour episodes on, on consecutive, three consecutive Sundays, and MNET did it 
with one a pilot of two hours and then four one hour. And so Japan's doing an anime version. Yeah. Four hundred episodes in eight seconds each. So I was very involved with the editing as well because the editing, you know, is also quite important. So I had to occur that. And then the marketing starts, and the Germans come and the Americans come and they want to talk to you. So there was so much time. I mean, the last the month before we went on A and M, and I, I was in Johannesburg all the time, not getting getting any writing done because we had to market the hell out of the series. So uh, it took a lot of time. What well, um, can you tell us about? The, other than that, Benny's in trouble. <laughs> the new book. The new book. Um, I, it's going to be very tough to say anything and not give spoilers for, for this book. But okay. as you know, um, at the end of this book, Benny, there, is, there are some serious doubts about Benny and, and Gold's future. And I am now having to deal with that. 